So as I was saying, I'm Dr. Rems. What we're gonna do today is focus on, someone told me I have Parkinson's, what should we do about it? Uh, usually when a doctor is having this talk with you, the main focus is gonna be medication. That's not different today, but I'll try and highlight some of the other factors as well, because I think they are equally, if not more important. Uh, I've got some disclosures. Basically, uh, my fellowship training is supported by some nice people on the Blumenthal Foundation and by Abby, but I see none of that stuff directly. Uh, Dr. Nita Chen, one of the co-fellows, gave me some of these slides, and I appreciate the chance to speak to you guys today. Uh, first question, what's Parkinson's? So I think that, interestingly, everyone that's spoken to you so far has kind of had this assumption that we know exactly what Parkinson's is. I'm gonna challenge that a little bit. I don't think Parkinson's is one disease. Um, there's a reason that if you have Parkinson's, uh, one of the things we like to tell people is if you've seen one person with Parkinson's, you've seen one person with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. It's widely variable person to person. It's widely variable day to day. You'll have a day where this disease is the hardest thing you've ever gone through, and then the next day you may feel okay, and that's a shared experience among those with Parkinson's. Uh, so I think that's important to highlight when you're talking about how we're gonna manage this, because that understanding is crucial, saying if this medicine works or not, well, just because you have one rough day might not be the best way to judge that information. It's important to know that's kind of part and parcel of a disease. Uh, there are some things that make Parkinson's similar between people, and the classic way to think about this is what are called the cardinal features of Parkinson's disease. And uh, it's actually Parkinsonism. So Parkinsonism is where you have this set of motor symptoms that go together. Yeah, and the most common cause of Parkinsonism uh, at least in this room for sure, the idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So you might hear these words thrown around quite a bit. Uh, bradykinesia just means slow movement. That's why your doctor asks you to tap, tap, tap your fingers when they're looking at you. Uh, it's interesting that there's a lot of things that can cause slow movement, and that's one of the good reasons to have someone who looks at this disease a lot look at you, because there's some particular things we look at uh, when we're looking at someone's slow movement. If the movement gets smaller, the more we do it, if it gets interrupted when we're trying to repeat it quite a bit. These relate to the type of slow movement that we see in Parkinson's. This basal ganglia, this set of structures in the deep brain that people have been talking about all morning, can sometimes act as like a go, no-go button in the brain. The brain doesn't want to go when it should. You're telling it, keep tapping those fingers, but that go, no-go signal isn't quite getting through. And this underlies a lot of the Parkinson's symptoms. Rigidity is a type of stiffness uh, and I say it's a stiffness that comes from the brain because if you have osteoarthritis, which unfortunately as we get older is pretty common, that also causes stiffness when you wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. If you had an old stroke, it would cause a type of stiffness called spasticity. But the specific type of stiffness that a uh, doctor who studies Parkinson's will be able to tell is there called rigidity. Uh, tremor, I think, doesn't need an introduction. Most people know about it. But the one thing I would highlight here is it's different than dyskinesia. Dyskinesia is a writhing constant movement. Tremor is a rhythmic movement, usually around a single axis. So for example, going up and down across the wrist joint, that's an axis. Um, that's more of an important point for helping describe to your doctor what's going on. Uh, and then there's postural instability. That means that we fall. And you can fall for a lot of reasons and it's complicated, but in Parkinson's, some of the reflexes that would keep us from falling when something disrupts our balance aren't quite there. Um, and that's usually a later finding. Now, if you have two of these four, Parkinsonism. So if a neurologist who knows what they're looking for, you know, not just any shaking, not all shaking is tremor, not just any stiffness, not all stiffness is rigidity. But if you have two of these four features, someone's gonna label you as Parkinsonism. And then it's our job to say, why do you have Parkinsonism? Sometimes it can be caused by a medication or a structural change in the brain, like a stroke or a tumor. But most of the time, <clears throat> in our clinic, it ends up being Parkinson's disease if it looks a certain way. And from there, we talk about what can we do about it? You have this Parkinsonism, how can we fix it? And there's a host of non-motor features, things that aren't these movement symptoms that come with Parkinson's disease. I'll touch on those towards the end of this talk. Uh, there was a talk by Dr. Malali, which can also be accessed as a recording. It's happening right now, where she focuses solely on that. But usually when you first come to the doctor to be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, the reason someone, your primary care office sent you to a neurologist is you have a tremor or you're slow or you're stiff. And so we're gonna focus on that first. I like to put this in the beginning uh, because I think it is perhaps the most important part. And that's that 
medication isn't everything. I'm gonna spend most of our time together talking about medication, but especially early in the disease, medication is probably most useful as a way to provide you the ability to maintain your staying active lifestyle. If you're not able to stay active because you can't move, medication is a great segue to that. But if you ask me if I can choose one thing, you're gonna exercise every day, or you're gonna take my medi medication, early in the disease, I'm gonna choose that you exercise every day. Now, it changes with time, this is an introductory lecture. Um, what kind of exercise is important? It's not trivial. I would not recommend doing just cardio. I think if you talk to a heart doctor, they might say that's good enough. Uh, in Parkinson's, we know that a combination of factors is important. Stretching is usually the one that gets left out, okay? Taking your joints through the range of motion. I'm not talking about anything crazy, just making the joint move the normal course range of motion that it should move is really important to maintain that range of motion. I think there's an old adage about if you don't lose it, you, you don't use it, you lose it. It's not quite true, but it has some grain of truth uh, when you talk about this condition. Uh, so a combination of those factors, consistent exercise, the only thing we know of that can help reduce the progression of Parkinson's disease that we can say for sure helps that you could do right now. Can't emphasize that enough. The therapy services, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, these disciplines all have a role for addressing symptoms that medication can't address. Some of the walking changes in Parkinson's do get better with medicine, some don't. Physical therapy is what's gonna help you there. Some of the things that you deal with every day, how can I use my sink when I'm shaking? How do I shave my face? Little tiny tasks that affect how good your life is every day. Occupational therapy may well be the most important tool to help you achieve success in those parts of your life as opposed to medication. And if you're asking me, why am I choking while I'm swallowing? Hopefully it happens later for most patients, but that's something that a speech therapist is gonna help you with. What kind of things can I do to keep my cognition active? That's things a speech therapist can help you with. So I think it's really important, anyone who talks to you about how do I manage Parkinson's is engage this stuff early. It's a pain, it takes time out of your day or out of your week. You have to physically go somewhere or do a Zoom call and have someone work with you. It's not trivial and the effort we're asking you to put forth all this stuff the disadvantage it has compared to a pill is you don't just take a pill. You have to actually do something and do it consistently. Um, but it's really important that your provider, whoever that might be, emphasizes how important this is. Okay, so almost every Parkinson's talk, when they start talking about the disease, we'll show you a diagram that looks like this. When they start talking about dopamine, ignore this. Uh, way too complicated for us. Some of you will send, uh, see a diagram that looks like this. Mostly ignore this. Uh, so there's dopamine, and there's a part in the top, it's a transmitting neuron, it's up here, and a receptor cell. And so the big part about this is my brain's sending signal from one cell to another, one nerve cell to another. And one of the ways it sends that signal, there's lots of ways, is with this dopamine. And in Parkinson's, there's less of it to send that signal. That's all I want you to take from that. Here's the slide that most people will show you when they're talking about how medicines in Parkinson's work. I also want you to ignore this. I'm gonna give you a simple version, which is that most of the medicines make the dopamine last longer or be more of it. I'll tell you which ones do which, and those are the different enzymes it works on to do those things. There are medicines that don't work on dopamine as well, and I would definitely emphasize those as we go. Here's a busy slide with a bunch of names of medicines that you may have seen before. I want you to also ignore this. We're gonna to go to the next couple of slides where we'll talk about individual medications. The point of this slide is that's a lot of names of medicines. Uh, there's a lot of things that potentially can be done and I think one of the frustrations with patients that I've managed with Parkinson's can be, I'm only doing X percent better. There's thousand other things that we haven't tried. Is there a reason that we're not doing that? Hopefully, um, there is. And hopefully this talk can help you have some insight into that. But if it's not clear, you should definitely ask your doctor, what about this, what about that? And I'll give you some of the reasons to ask those questions as we go forward. So this is dopamine. It's a pretty drawing, right? I didn't make it. Um, <laughs> so what is dopamine is important to this talk uh, because it's not just a movement used for cells to talk that help us move better. We know in Parkinson's we don't have enough of it and we don't have enough of it that go, no go signal doesn't work as well. We get stuck, <clears throat> we freeze, we shake, we're stiff, we fall. But it does a lot of other things in the brain too when eventually you're gonna ask me what are the side effects of these medications and understanding that this molecule has a lot of roles is important to understanding that. So. Uh, what we think is a lot of those cardinal features we talked about do have a relationship to this, to this dopamine. Uh, the postural instability, the falls, is probably the exception here. Um, but it's also, you know, when you talk about dopamine that you're not in a room full of people with Parkinson's, 
what they talk about is a pleasure molecule, what gets released when you're addicted to something, uh, right, in a different part of the brain towards the front, mm -hmm. as opposed to the part of the brain deep in the brain that we talk about in Parkinson's called the basal ganglia. And so it's important to know it's the same dopamine. If I'm replacing dopamine in your brain, it's the same dopamine. Okay. So here are the symptoms that respond to meditations that affect dopamine. Okay. Stiffness. That's probably the most underrated. It is rare, and I see a good number of patients with Parkinson's. It's rare that the primary complaint that someone tells you about when they have a tremor and they're here to see you for their tremor is that they're stiff. It's not rare that they tell you that they feel like they can't do what they used to do or that they just don't feel themselves or they're having trouble moving. Oftentimes, the greater disability of Parkinson's disease, the inability to complete tasks, is because of these two up here, the stiffness and the slowness. And oftentimes, dopamine is really, really good at fixing those things. Not for everyone, but for a lot of people. And one of the challenges here is you can see the tremor, and your friend can see the tremor, and your mom can see the tremor, your son can see the tremor. And so if the tremor doesn't go all the way away to the dopamine, it's easy to say, is this medicine doing what it's supposed to do? In a perfect world, you'd come to your doctor and they'd look at you and they'd see you before the medicine and after the medicine and be able to assess and help you with that. But if you're trying to figure out why I might feel better, but my tremor looks different, it's because those top two symptoms are probably the ones most likely to respond to this therapy, are probably the most disabling symptoms of the disease um, in the early stages. And also, uh, less visible to the naked eye than tremor. Tremor is challenging. Something like 15 to 30% of people who have tremor predominant Parkinson's, Parkinson's that starts off with a very predominant tremor, won't have the tremor go away with dopamine. So that still means the lion's share, you know, two thirds, three quarters, do have that go away with the appropriate dose, okay? There's a lot of other things we can do about it. I'll touch on those at the end of the talk, but uh, for the most part, tremor responds to dopamine, but not completely, not like the first two. Fine motor task is tough. So fine motor tasks do respond to dopamine, but our brain releases dopamine in little tiny levels when we do fine motor activities and in tonic levels, constant levels throughout the day. We're replacing the constant levels throughout the day. And early in the disease, the cells that are still alive help us with those tiny amounts. Later in the disease, when the cells are not doing almost any of the work and only the medicine is doing the work, the dopamine will work less well for helping with the fine motor disease. And that's kind of expected and challenging, but something that's important to realize is that that fine motor piece may become more challenging even if at first it responded to dopamine, and that's part and parcel of Parkinson's disease and how it works. Gait. So gait's one of the most complicated things humans do, is walking. It might not feel like it because you learn it when you're like one uh, years old, but it is. It ha takes a huge number of different parts of your brain to do gait, and as we get older, there's a huge number of things that can make gait more difficult. You can have balance problems for a lot of reasons that aren't your Parkinson's. When you talk about what the medicine that we're talking about, dopamine-based medications are gonna do for your Parkinson's, you're mostly talking about gait speed. You're sometimes talking about how much you swing your arm or how much you drag your leg, which can sometimes help you fall less. If you're one of the lucky ones, it can sometimes reduce freezing, which can cause falls, which is when you try to move forward through a doorway and you're turning and your body just doesn't listen and you kind of get stuck. But in most cases, gait is too complex for just dopamine to help and it will help some and incompletely and if you're getting more advanced in the disease, dopamine, th dopamine therapy alone is unlikely to be the answer to your gait problems. And this is again where I direct you to something like physical therapy where they can give you specific techniques to say, you're freezing this doorway, put a piece of flat tape or a line on the door so you have a physical external cue to step over. This can help you unfreeze. Learn techniques building forward, marching in place, using rhythm. There are techniques that can be used to address these symptoms. We should leave it all to this molecule. All right, I guess we have to start talking about the actual medicines now with the long names. Uh, otherwise, we'll get in trouble, right? So what is carbidopa, levodopa? Hopefully you've heard of this if you're in this room. This is the generic name for Cinemet and the most common medication for Parkinson's. Uh, it's still the best one uh, overall. What's the best medicine for this disease? It's this medicine. It comes in a bunch of different forms and I'm gonna go into those in a little more depth later, but I wanna kind of highlight the 10,000 foot view. So levodopa is L-dopa. It's a precursor uh, building block of protein. It comes into the body. It's used in all the parts of the body to turn into dopamine. Your kidneys like dopamine, your blood vessels like dopamine, your belly uses dopamine. It's not just the brain. That's where carbidopa comes in. So carbidopa blocks levodopa from turning into dopamine until it gets to the brain. So carbidopa doesn't enter the brain at all. It just stays in the body. And wherever carbidopa is, the, brain has, the body has trouble turning levodopa into dopamine. 
it doesn't get in the brain, so the levodopa does get in the brain and turns into dopamine. That's how it works. And so some of the side effects that you see, especially the ones highlighted here, are from dopamine on other parts of the body. So sometimes when you're lightheaded, it's from the medicine directly, but sometimes it's because the blood vessels in your legs, your kidneys, are allowing blood to pool there and not going back up to your brain fast enough. And that's because some of that levodopa <coughs> is turning into dopamine in the kidney instead of in the brain. It's important to realize that because that gives us an opportunity to fix it. There's, you can give more carbidopa by itself um, to try and address that sometimes. You can just joke stage forms. There's, there's things to be talked about there. So nausea, you might guess the belly might be involved there. Nausea is a pretty tough symptom for us as doctors because a lot of things make you feel kind of icky and we call it nausea and not all nausea is the same activity in the gut that we're talking about. But if it's actually the belly grumbling, sometimes that's because of dopamine receptors in the gut. Uh, leg swelling, because the blood vessels in the legs pool, right? And uh, dizziness is kind of like nausea. It's real complicated. Dizziness can mean a lot of things. But some of those symptoms are from the medicine itself being used in the body. Those symptoms, sometimes you can work around. Something like sleepiness, impulse control disorder, dyskinesias, hallucinations, uh, I'm gonna talk about each of these a little bit more, but the point is that those ones that aren't bold, those are usually from the dopamine in the brain. We talked about how dopamine does a lot of things in the brain, not just movement. These are some of those things. And the issue there is that's when we have to start making selections later in the disease between how much do we want to fix these symptoms with this chemical versus how much side effects we're gonna get. Because if they're both brain effects, our ability to modulate that is much more challenging because it's dopamine in the brain where we want it but it's causing your symptoms to get better and causing you to have hallucinations. Well, sometimes that's a limitation there. Sometimes there's medicines that we can use to just affect the hallucinations, but in general, those are more limiting symptoms where you start talking about more advanced therapies. Okay, so here's some fancy graphs that I actually do want you to look at. So this is what happens when you take carbidopa levodopa, and this is what happens in your bloodstream. So basically the idea is early in Parkinson's, right? You take some carbidopa levodopa and your brain still has some good cells. They take up some of it, they let some back out. They kind of keep it regular. Your brain regulates it. As the disease becomes more progressed, there's two things that happen. How much you need to get an effect, this bottom line, the threshold response. So this line represents how much of my blood do I need before it fixes my symptoms? This top line is how much do I need in my system before it starts causing problems? This middle part is, yeah, it's working good. Okay? So two different things will happen. One, this window of the good zone gets smaller and it gets smaller because there's less of these cells to buffer it, less of these healthy cells that can take up and release the dopamine as opposed to just bathing the cells in it, okay? And the second thing that happens is the actual content of the chemical in the brain is less stable because instead of having some from the medicine and some from the brain, it's all from the medicine, right? So it's just what we give you, that's what you got, as opposed to the brain can modulate it. So what level in the blood helps you the most changes gets harder to hit that level over time and how much you have in the blood changes because it's contribution from the brain or just from us, okay? So that can be complicated, but I wanna kind of make it a little clearer because I think it's worth knowing when you talk about how can I make the symptoms better and is one of like the primary things to understand in Parkinson's. So here's an example of someone who takes carbidopa levodopa four times a day. They take their medicine and this is their medicine. They take it seven, goes up, it goes down. Take it at 11, goes up, it goes down. They take it at three, it goes up, it goes down. Take it at seven, it goes up and it goes down. Right, and then they go to sleep. That's why it's flat at the end. So this is what you'd have if it was just the carbidopa levodopa, right? Just from the taking it in the pill form. Your brain is pretty smart, and especially early in the disease, you have a curve in your blood that looks like this. And you have a therapeutic window that looks like this. And everyone is happy. You're early in the disease, and you're able, so back here, you're probably not in a therapeutic window. You just woke up in the morning, you feel off. You take your first day, dose of the day, or maybe you're lucky and you wake up feeling on. You go into this therapeutic window, you're not getting too high in the dopamine content, getting problems, hallucinations, dyskinesias. You're not getting too low where you feel off. As time progresses, sometimes, sometimes you have this. So instead of having content that's buffered by the cells, you lose some more of those nerve cells. And besides exercise, we don't have a good way to slow down that loss of nerve cells, right? Your carbidopa leva content, instead of being that kind of smoother line, see how ugly and jagged this is? It's actually ugly and jagged because I drew it myself uh, with a mouse, but uh, it's also ugly and jagged because you're not having it buffered anymore in your system. And that means it's harder and your therapeutic window does this. And so now it's not as much time 
in that kind of good space. There's time up here and time down here, on your way up and on your way down. Meet your dose. Now, up here, the worst, the typical thing we think of is dyskinesia. Now, before I go further, I just want to kind of take a minute to talk about this piece. And the reason is because I think people who are coming to a symposium like this, you know, have already taken a step to kind of try and take control of their disease and learn about it. And what's really common is when a patient like that comes to visit me in the clinic, and I say, hey, we're going to start Cinemet. It's going to help with these symptoms, the stiffness and the slowness. You're going to feel better on it. They tell me, well, I'm worried about my friend Bob, who took this medicine, and now he does this all the time, and it seems really scary, and what can I do to prevent this? Or I went to a Parkinson's support group, and I saw people with advanced disease, and they had a lot of these movements, and they're worried about the carbidopa luvidopa causing this dyskinesia. And, and they're not wrong, right? You're taking the medicine, it's causing it to go up, it's causing it to go down, you're going above that therapeutic window, and you're causing this extra movement, right? The question is, does taking carbidopa levodopa earlier cause you to be more likely to have this phenomenon? Because it only happens when you take the medicine, right? Or you take dopamine, at least for most folks. And the answer is that that's not how it works. It's those buffering extra cells that are dying away with time. It's how long you've had the disease that predicts whether or not you're going to develop these dyskinesias. Now, if I never give you the carbidopa levodopa and you lose those cells, your graph's going to look like this. It's going to stay down here. You're not going to hit the therapeutic window. Your symptoms won't get better. And for most folks, you won't develop dyskinesia. But whether or not you start carbidopa levodopa the day you're diagnosed, or you start at five years from when you're diagnosed, this window is still thinning. This line is still going to be closer to what we're giving you than what the brain helps you with. And that's why you develop dyskinesia with the medication. And so it's not necessarily a good idea to wait to take the medication because you're wasting that time where this medication can facilitate your ability to exercise and stay active where you're in this kind of more positive zone because you only have that certain opportunity. Right now, we don't have something that slows down the loss of those nerve cells, so we don't have a way. And we know this from some really interesting studies in Africa where you didn't have access to this medication and they still developed dyskinesias uh, when started on the medication, even if they didn't start the medication early in disease. So we have some good data to support this. But this was an area of debate for many, many years in the field and results in a lot of people, <clears throat> even physicians being unsure about the answer to that question. I think it's really important to walk away with this saying, okay, this is a medicine that addresses the problem in Parkinson's, which is not enough dopamine. It gives me a lot of benefits. And over time, it's likely to have some side effects. And that's kind of part of the deal. So why is it good? It's cheap. Okay. It's the best medication for slowness and stiffness. It's okay for tremor. It's fairly predictable early in the disease. As we get later in the disease, that's not the case. There's a lot of complicated issues and advanced disease I'm not gonna talk about. Like if the medicine gets from the belly into the bloodstream, it can be an issue. If you have constipation, it can be an issue. Um, in studies, it has really, really impressive importance in quality of life. Um, why is it bad? Because over time, when you stop having that buffering, you saw that graph with just four times a day, right? You need to push those times closer together to get that curve to be more steady, okay? Uh, and then dyskinesias. So this does cause dyskinesias later in the disease or when you need more medication. Um, so this is the kind of prototype. This is Cinemet, carbidopa, levodopa. That's the basic one most people start with. Then there's Cinemet CR. I gotta tell you, it's not my favorite, uh, but it has a really important place. So Cinemet CR is basically the same as the last one, but it's got a thick cap around it. Uh, it's con considered controlled release, but it really is that it takes longer for the outside of the pill to dissolve. So if you break this in half, it's no longer really CR. Now, you can do it, you can break it in half. It'll kind of work halfway between an IR and a CR because it'll only be partially coated, okay? The reason it's better is because we talked about those peaks. You remember those peaks in that graph that went above that therapeutic window? Those peaks, right, are gonna be lower with CR. So sometimes if you're having certain side effects, a physician might try to do this medication to avoid some of those peak dose side effects. The disadvantage is it's a little less consistent and that because it takes longer to get absorbed into your system, sometimes you can have a stacking effect where your first dose today you're great, and at the end of the day, there's been some buildup. The doses have kind of started to stack on each other and you have some side effects at the end of the day. Uh, finally, uh, at least one insurance company recently started making this a problem to get. Um, if anyone's dealt with that, I'm sorry. Just uh, let your doctor know early. Uh, it used to be this was really, really easy to get. Uh, part of the reason it became harder to get is because of this medication. This is Ritari. You might have noticed something interesting. Uh, look at the top of this side. See it says carbidopa levodopa? Look at the top of this side. Carbidopa levodopa, top of this side. Carbidopa levodopa, they're all carbidopa levodopa, 
Okay, it's the exact same ingredient. It's how the pill is packaged that's different for these medications. Same active ingredients, okay? And that's important to note. Um, so this is a pill where there's different size beads of the medication within a capsule. That means that once you empty the capsule, it's still long acting because there's different size beads. Um, so people can, you can even mix it with applesauce, it's safe to do that. Uh, the doses are weird, confusing numbers. So if you go from carbidopa, levodopa, which is that nice 25, 100 number, those numbers are not the same in Ritari. Mm -hmm. The numbers are the numbers are made up, all right? Uh, so you just got to ask your doctor about how to convert those. If you try and do a one-to-one -one conversion, <laughs> it's not going to work out for you. Um, this has some of the same issues. Perfect. Uh, got some of the same issues as the CR formulation. Some of the advantages are it's a little more consistent. It has both short-acting and locked-acting forms, so you don't have the delay, the same delay, for it to take uh, for it to take effect. The big disadvantage to Ritari is that it's expensive and usually is with insurance issues. It's going generic, I think, this year. So that will make a big difference for cost. It'll, it'll be a, there'll be a delay, right, because it goes generic, and then the generic companies have to formulate it and make it. Um, and that's why you heard about IPX203 in the talk in the morning, because now the company that makes Ritari wants a new product to patent so they can charge a lot of money for it again. <laughs> but uh, for Ritari, it's actually something that we use less than we could have because the relative amount of benefit doesn't often line up with the exponential increase in cost. But as that cost comes down with it becoming generic, it may be a more useful product over time. The one thing I caution people about with Ritari is because some of it's long acting and some of it's short acting within an individual capsule of Ritari, sometimes you don't have that same prominent on effect that people in the mid stage of disease can get. They take the pill 15 to 30 minutes later, they feel, okay, I feel this pill working in. Sometimes Ritari has a little less of that, or if you have bad constipation, it doesn't get absorbed the same way. So if you're making a switch to Ritari from Cinemet, usually the reason is my medicine's not lasting as long as it used to, or I'm having more off time. They make that switch for you to help you. You might feel like it doesn't have the same punch to it. Give it time and ask about dosing levels. That's the advice there. Give it time and ask about dosing levels, okay? And also make sure you're treating constipation. If you're not having a bowel movement every day and you're on Ritari, it might be more of a problem for you than if you're not having a bowel movement every day and you're on Cinemet. So if you have Parkinson's, I would encourage you to treat constipation if you have it. So a uh, quick slide here about other forms of levodopa before I move on. Uh, these are for advanced stuff. So this is an intro talk, I'm not gonna get into these. The point is that this fancy surgery where they put a pump, that's a pump, goes into your belly, and there's like a little disc there that has a computer program, right? This is super advanced therapy, a surgical therapy on your belly to give you carbidopa levodopa consistently. Can you guess what the medicine is that? Carbidopa levodopa, yeah, same one. So just, just so you're aware, right? Um, the one exception to this is Embresia, which is just levodopa. That means if you are trying Embresia and you're not taking any oral carbidopa, it won't work. That'll just get converted immediately and not get it into the brain. Uh, Embresia is kind of this new thing and it's for people who are going, going, going and suddenly turn off. It's, uh, it's not quite a nasal spray, it's actually beads that are absorbed as opposed to a true spray, but it looks like this. You spray it in your nostril and it gives 42 milligrams. So, uh, you may be familiar that an average pill of carbidopa levodopa is 25 milligrams of carbidopa and 100 milligrams of levodopa. This is 42 milligrams of levodopa generally. So you can use the applicator to apply more than capsule, but it tends to be expensive. Uh, it's got a roll, but if you're on, let's say, carbidopa levodopa three times a day, four times a day, probably this isn't yet time to spend this money and probably it will work less well for you. Um, so I think sometimes people will see a commercial and say, hey, why don't we try this medication? And the answer is it could be a useful medication, but it's a very small window where we want to use that. It's a very specific indication, which is I have these sudden off periods and that's where it's a really good time to try that. Like I can't predict it, I'm doing really well and suddenly I turn off. That happens to some folks, it's unfortunate, it's hard to deal with. That's maybe a time to talk about that one. The Duopa is something that you should have a good neurologist at your side talking to, talking to you about, okay, we've tried some other things before they start talking about belly surgery. Okay, we're gonna talk about something that's a different class of medication. These are dopamine agonists, okay? That means that humans made molecules that make the brain think it's dopamine. It's not dopamine, but it activates those receptors, okay? The good of this is that when humans make a molecule, they can make it a little different. So we can, carbidopa, levodopa, if you have no help from the brain cells, maybe 180 minutes it lasts, right? Three hours, roughly. Um, you know, you can go longer earlier in the disease because your brain cells help. We can make dopamine agonists that last longer than 180 minutes, so you can take them less frequently. 
but they have a problem in that they're not as strong in their effect. And when you increase the dose to make them strong enough, you deal with some of those side effects that are not the peripheral side effects, but the brain side effects, that's hard to find that happy balance. I'm not a huge fan of using older folks. And the reason is because as we get older, the risk increases for two really important things. One is impulse control disorders, second is hallucinations, and the third is sleep attacks. Um, I said two, but it's the hallucinations and sleep attacks that are more risk as we get older and the ICDs that remain high risk. So impulse control disorders is you start suddenly having, it's why that guy's carrying a bunch of debt. He, you start gambling, you start using pornography, you say things that you shouldn't say to the person who looks weird in the supermarket. You can't control your impulses. And that's scary and wouldn't necessarily immediately seem like a medication side effect, but this can be ruinous. I mean, if you suddenly start compulsively online shopping and you're on a fixed income, that's a big deal. So that does happen with any dopamine, but is much more common with these medications. Sleep attacks, obviously, uh, if you fall asleep while you're driving, is very dangerous, so we need to know about that. The first time you try one of these medications, you want to do it at a time. We're not about to do something else. You're at a home, safe environment, someone with you. And then hallucinations can happen with carbon dopa, levodopa, or these, but these medications are a little le more likely to cause them. Interestingly, they have a couple good uses, okay? A lot of people with Parkinson's have restless legs. These work a little better for restless legs. If you're still early enough on the disease that a small dose doesn't give you trouble, sometimes they can last through the night better since they last a little bit longer. So sometimes people will take them at night to kind of make it through the next morning. If you have very mild early disease and you still work, there's a 24 hour day patch you can stick on it and it works, it's expensive, but it exists. Uh, and finally, if you have a lot of dyskinesias, sometimes people will use a small dose of these to try and get you just into that therapeutic window without overshooting you because they're such small amounts and they're relatively steady in the bloodstream when you have them. So there are weight reasons to use these, but the reason that you don't hear about them as often in some clinics is if you're over 65 or so, the risk of these hallucinations and sleep attacks are high enough that we have to have a compelling reason to do it. They're very safe when used in a small dose, but on their own in a small dose are less likely to give you the bang for the buck you might hope for. Um, there's intermediate release and extended release forms. Here's a bunch of names of them. Mirapax is the brand name. Panapexol is the generic name. Requip is the brand name. Repinerol is the generic name. Nupro is the uh, brand name. This one's the only really, really expensive of these. Sometimes the ER forms, the long acting forms are, but Nupro is the patch. And that tends to be uh, cost prohibitive with insurance often, even if insurance covers it, which can be challenging. And then finally, Apokine. Uh, most people don't like giving themselves injections, but if you have those sudden offs, we talked about that uh, nasal administered medication. One of the other options is something called Apokine, which is an injectable version, uh, which works really, really, really well. It's very potent, works stronger than the Embrasia. The big drawback for Apokine is that it can cause a lot of serious nausea right away. So if you're a lucky person who doesn't get the serious nausea and you have sudden offs, I often try that in my patients, but uh, the first time you try that, you probably want to be near somewhere where if you had to vomit, you're going to be okay. Um, okay. I'm going to try and make it a little quicker to go through the remainder. So the big classes so far, medications that replicate dopamine in the brain, okay? Medications that humans made to try and look like dopamine that come with some side effects, but have a limited role. The next several are ways to make our natural dopamine last longer, okay? So carbon dopa blocks a dopa decarboxylase in the bloodstream, keeps your blood from turning it into dopamine. COMP-T inhibitors, uh, chemical o methyltransferase uh, enzyme inhibitors, they basically, there's a little bit of the dopamine that's getting broken down, you block some of the breakdown, okay? These are called enticapone or apicapone. Stilevo is a formulation that has carbidopa, levodopa, and enticapone. The couple reasons you don't see these as much. The effect is somewhat similar to adding a little bit more carbidopa, levodopa, so sometimes that's simpler, okay? Enticapone needs to be taken with each dose of cinnamon when you're taking it, so it ends up being quite a few pills. Opicapone is once daily and works like enticapone, but is very expensive. So for the amount of extra time you get, sometimes it has a role. It's definitely worth trying, but can sometimes be limiting. And Stilevo is, can sometimes reduce your number of pills because it kind of combines that extra COMT with it. But the dosing regimen is specific. You can't adjust individual components. They're already stuck together in the pill. So it's gonna be more expensive and less flexible. That's a reason why not. I'll tell you in my practice, I rarely use COMT inhibitors. The reason is typically someone has a job and they can't break to have the medication more frequently, right? And so they have three times a day they can take the medicine, but they're wearing off an hour early each time. Sometimes in those patients, 
early in the disease, you'll add an endocathone with each of those doses because they still have that same break time. Um, as the disease progresses and you become more frequent during the day, it becomes less feasible to use these. Unfortunately, they are more likely to cause some of the side effects like dyskinesia. So if you start having dyskinesias, sometimes one of the first things they'll do is peel back one of these medications off of your regimen. Basically, extend dopamine. MAL-B inhibitors are kind of a really mild medication. They used to be thought to be neuroprotective, uh, as elect was. Uh, the studies didn't bear that out, but some folks still try them hoping that it has an effect, okay? Uh, MAL-B is another enzyme that breaks down dopamine. We're trying to kind of keep our dopamine alive. The B is actually important. It seems like we don't care about the names that much, and that's mostly true. But MAL-A inhibitors are an old class of antidepressant, which have a bunch of side effects. If anyone's seen like the Silence of the Lambs, he makes a joke on the plane about drinking Chianti wine and eating liver uh, because these increase a, something called tyramine, uh, which is an uh, amino acid that's broken down by the monoamine oxidase uh, and causes psychiatric effects. So the point is that MAL-B inhibitors are a mild medication that are different than non-specific MAL inhibitors and actually are okay. If you start one of those, uh, these are good mild once a day medications. They might give you a little more bang for your buck. I do occasionally use them. Um, Selegiline has a metabolite that actually looks chemically like methamphetamine, which sounds scary, uh, but not addictive, not habit forming, and actually can provide some energy. So some folks use a little bit of selegiline in the morning when they have a lot of fatigue. It doesn't work for everyone, but it's kind of a worthwhile little pro tip. Um, but it's notable that these are generally okay with antidepressants. Ask your doctor, they need to check your blood pressure. There are medicines that they interact with, but the pharmacy, when you start these, almost always, if you're on an antidepressant medicine, will say, you can't do that, you can't do that. So you can do that. Um, not always, not for everyone, ask your doctor, but it's not as much of a crisis as perhaps you'll be led to believe when you first pick up this medication. Um, so be aware that you're not the first person hearing that story. And I have many, many patients on that combination of therapy who do just fine. Um, so I wanna just talk about non-dopamine medications because we're gonna run out of time here. So there's uh, amantadine, okay? It can cause quite a few side effects. If it works for you, it's one of the only medicines that can help the Parkinson's motor symptoms and reduce dyskinesias. Most times you're choosing one or the other. The big drawback is it can cause hallucinations. So dry mouth, yes, dry eyes, yes, confusion, yes. Usually hallucinations are the limiting factor for this medication. Um, so it's not as good late in the disease. But when someone has dyskinesias with extra movements, this is usually the first medicine when it's safe that I will reach for to suppress those dyskinesias. So the reason to ask for that medicine is that. The other piece is both Symmetril or Ermantidine and Artinotraxifenadil, which you'll see here, are medications that can affect that tremor when carbidopa levodopa doesn't. So if you're in that 15 to 30% where the levodopa just doesn't stop your tremor at all, those are medications that if you don't have cognitive side effects, you can kind of usually use. They're not as good if you're older. Uh, Artan has the benefit of being good for dystonia. So if your toes curl when you're turned off, or if your kind of neck is stuck to one side, or your hands get stuck in position, sometimes that medication has a little bit more bang for your buck, but that one can cause confusion. So you gotta be really careful. Also gotta be careful it makes you have trouble peeing. Uh, in the bottom of this slide is kind of a little bit of a throwaway. I included a newer medication called Norions or Istradefiline. Uh, the thing to note about that medication is it works on adenosine, totally different me molecule. Two things to take away about that. One, there are other neurotransmitters besides dopamine affected in Parkinson's. We know this. There's higher rates of depression and anxiety. That's why they might suggest that you start an SSRI even if you don't have fluorid depression in Parkinson's because you're low on that serotonin that those medications affect. Uh, this is an example of a mechanism that doesn't use dopamine. Uh, the other reason it's interesting is because this medication wouldn't typically affect more dopaminergic side effects, although its effect is very, very mild and it can be expensive. Uh, finally, it's the same receptor that coffee affects. So that's kind of interesting. Adenosine is what coffee affects. Um, okay, so it looks like I'm about to get pulled off this stage. So I want to say one last thing, if that's okay, uh, which is when you come to the clinic and you have symptoms and you don't know how someone should help you, okay, pay attention to what happens, when it happens, and when you're taking your medication and write it down. Because it is really hard on Parkinson's that causes a ton of symptoms to know, is this my Parkinson's? Is this AGE, my old age? Is this arthritis? Is this something else? It's hard to know that, and we're gonna help you try and figure it out. But you need to tell us, if you tell me, okay, an hour after my medicine every time, I need to take a nap, then I'm thinking that you're gonna have excessive sleepiness from the carbidopa levodopa. 
that's an important thing to know. If you're telling me that I shake and wiggle every time I take the medicine, that's very different than I shake and wiggle right before I take the medicine. And there's no way that I in the clinic with you for 30 minutes can figure it out. So when it happens, when it happens in relation to your medicine, okay? And finally, I think it's on this slide. Uh, it's probably not because on another slide, which is, is it worth doing something about? It? Sometimes it's, it's good to share with us, but sometimes if, if your answer is, I don't want to take any more medicine or do something about this, make sure that's something that the provider is aware of when you tell them about the complaint. I got a lot more for you guys, but I want to make sure you can listen to the smarter people give questions, but thanks for your attention.